In his 2002 State of the Union speech, President George W. Bush declared worldwide war on terrorism and terrorist states. While most of the country and many political leaders were focused on retribution for the 9-11 attacks, the Bush administration believed they saw the larger picture and the likelihood of more attacks if the United States remained passive regarding the states that sponsor the terrorists. Thousands of dangerous killers, schooled in the methods of murder, often supported by outlaw regimes, are now, are now spread throughout the world like ticking time bombs set to go off without warning. Operation Enduring Freedom was the first campaign in the war on terror, and Operation Iraqi Freedom would be the second. From everything I've seen, there were people, and Rumsfeld was one, uh, and I think President Bush, the second Bush, was himself convinced that there was some linkage here between Al-Qaeda uh, and Saddam Hussein. It was you know, a strained link at best. I think most uh, analysts say there wasn't really anything there. Um, but apparently there were some members of the administration who were determined that they wanted to and finish the job uh, in Iraq and that there, there must be some connection um, between the two, even if there wasn't. It seems similar to the, the reasoning about the weapons of mass destruction, that if he was hiding something, that must be what he was hiding, so therefore there must be weapons of mass destruction, which there weren't. The Marine Corps is the youngest of all the American military services. The age of the average Marine is around 24 years, and there are nearly 19,000 teenagers in the Corps. I decided to join the Marine Corps in uh, about January of 1996. I had a friend of mine, a guy that I went to high school with, he, uh, he was joining the Marine Corps and uh, had called me and said, hey man, uh, what are you doing? I was like, nothing. He's like, hey, you want to go in the Marine Corps? I was like, man, you're crazy. There's no way I'm going in the Marine Corps. And um, I was working a dead-end job going nowhere, and um, my father was in the military. He was in the 101st in Vietnam. And, um, you know, I'd always had a, a, the military had always interested me. And so I, I molded over for two or three days, and they called him back uh, one morning and said, hey, what are you doing? He's like, I'm sleeping. I said, well, I'll meet you over at the recruiters this afternoon. And, you know, 6 May 1996, I stood on the Yellow Footprints down at Paris Island. So you know, I guess the rest is history, as they say. Joined the Marine Corps in February 1994. Uh, after a semester of college, I decided that uh, 
uh, when I didn't make the soccer team, it wasn't exciting enough. And uh, I always remember the Marine recruiter promising adventure. So uh, I signed up for the infantry. Uh, the recruiters and my drill instructors thought I was crazy, but that's what I, that's what I thought the Marine Corps was about. It was about the infantry. Uh, everybody else thought it was uh, the wrong choice, but uh, it's what I wanted to do. So I joined in 94. I did about five years active duty as an uh, assault man, 0351. Uh, with 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. Uh, we did a, a pump to Okinawa, got out, did some embassy duty. Well, it, what's funny is actually the Marine Corps call came first, um, but then it, it just wasn't working out. When I was in high school, um, my cousin, who had been a 53 pilot, was killed in a training accident. And I didn't know him super well, but he was that guy at all the family reunions that talked to and was cool and just, you know, he was a twin and he's from uh, the E-Town area. And uh, I, I just always thought he was pretty neat. And I remember talking to him a couple of times. So I was a little me mesmerized, but I didn't know what this thing the Marine Corps was. But when he was killed, I went to his funeral and of all the places, I guess, to fall in love with a service, it was there. The Marine Corps has always sought to recruit the best of the best in the tradition of the few, the proud, it was intense. Uh, Marine boot camp is intense. Um, I still remember the guy getting on the bus. There was a drill instructor, a staff sergeant, about six foot two and built like a toothpick. He, uh, you know, it's like you see in the movies, the first and last words out of, your out of your mouth will be, sir. He got on there and said, on behalf of Brigadier General J.D. Humble, I wish to welcome you to Paris Isles, South Carolina. The first and last words out of your mouth will be, sir, as I understood. We all sounded off, and of course it wasn't loud enough, and so we did it again, and he gets off the bus and, and yells, fall out. When the new Marines are ushered off the bus at boot camp, often bewildered and exhausted, they perform a lasting tradition. The drill instructor greets them as they get off the bus and orders them to line up, placing their feet on the four rows of 15 seats of yellow footprints that are painted in front of the receiving barracks company. From the moment these young men and women step off the bus and plant their feet on the yellow footprints, they're being reshaped into United States Marines. You know, gaggle out on the yellow footprints, and uh, there was a guy in my platoon that was standing next to me, and his name was, last name was Hill. And uh, his head was completely shaved, ex all except for a tuft of purple hair. And uh, the drill instructor walked up to him and said, son, what is that on your head? He said, sir, that's hair, sir. And bullshit, that's not hair, and grabs him by it. And I thought, he's going to kill him right here. This is going to be the first casualty of Paris Island tonight. And uh, a drill instructor walked up to me and said, go grab that hatch. And there's three sets of double doors. And uh, so I had a one in six chance of, of being right, and I was wrong. So I ran up there and opened the hatch. He said, not that hatch, the other one. So. After a couple minutes, I finally figured out which one he was talking about. And uh, it took me a couple days to realize that they owned everything because every, all the drill instructors say, uh, close my hatch now, do, uh, do this, walk past my truck, walk past everything they owned, everything. And I, I, it took me a couple days to realize that they actually didn't own everything on base. It was just uh, their speak, how, how they were, uh, I guess, transforming us from, you know, Joe the civilian to United States Marine. In the weeks that follow, they absorb the common tasks of military life. They learn to march and talk like Marines. They learn how to take care of themselves and their uniforms and equipment. And since every Marine is a rifleman, they learn how to handle and care for their M16A2 as if it were an extension of their body. Uh, you know, boot camp was just uh, you know, go, go to bed, go to eat, go to the bathroom whenever they told you to. Light comes on in the morning, jump out of the bed and uh, get ready for the next day, that was it. It's probably the only time I routinely went to church every Sunday just to, uh, uh, just to get a break. Boot camp is, I would say probably about 85 to 90% mental and about 10% physical. If you want to be there, if you have the mental tenacity to say, man, I'm leaving here one of two ways, in a bag, and dead, or as a Marine, you're gonna make it. Unless you just have some kind of physical injury that, that prevents you from success. The final weeks takes the recruits to the crucible. It's a severe test of patience and fortitude, 
and is the final trial of Marine recruit training. The Crucible emphasizes teamwork under stress. The recruits get eight hours of sleep during the entire 54-hour exercise. They march 40 miles in those 54 hours and receive two and a half MREs, meals ready to eat, which they must ration to last the entire exercise. The crucible is designed to test the recruits to their utmost and to teach them that it is together, rather than alone, that they are unstoppable. For me personally, I think, um, I think the mental tenacity was, uh, was there. Uh, the physical portion of it was there, um, but it's completely different. You, you run a lot on uh, just sheer willpower. Once we started running, everybody just kind of backed off. I think there's this, uh, this correlation between people who can run or be physically fit and leadership. Most times it's true, sometimes it's not, but in my favor, I guess it worked out. So they kind of backed off, like, she can run, we'll go yell at somebody else. It is a grueling mental and physical challenge that the recruits must pass to become Marines. You can never be ready. You can never be ready. It's like uh, somebody asking you, you ready to get married? Like, yeah, I think I am. Well, no, you're not. Well, you're not ready for Paris Island. You're not, well, I can't speak for Quantico, but you're not ready for Paris Island. You may think you're ready, but you're not. You get there and they do what they want to do. They're, they're great at it. By the time they reach the parade deck, they are shouting the cadence at the top of their lungs and marching in unison. The colors are raised, and there's a short ceremony in which the drill instructor presents each man with an eagle, globe, and anchor. They are now Marines. Boot camp turned the recruits into Marines, but their training was far from complete. After a short leave, they report to the School of Infantry. The school turns Marines into warriors. No matter what their job in the Marine Corps, from public affairs to motor transport mechanic, every Marine is trained to be first and foremost a rifleman. Uh, I spent a lot of time just um basically how to handle yourself in a combat situation. So when you tell somebody that you're an MP, they immediately think, oh, you're on base writing tickets. I've never written a citation or taken the grunts to, uh, and detained them or called their, you know, their staff duty or any, anything else like that. I've always been, uh, uh, I've always worked as a field MP. So I had a female platoon commander, three sergeant instructors, and then uh, then for the platoon and then the rest were male. So I remember my sergeant instructors very clearly and what was funny is my senior sergeant instructor, she was a, I think she was a gunny at the time, very tall, I think she was 6'1", so I'm sure we thought she was like 7'2 at the time. Um, this, her last name was Manus, we called her the Praying Manus, and she's phenomenal, she's a sergeant major now. But when I checked into Okinawa as a second lieutenant, uh, I remember she was the admin chief out there. She had since moved on from being a sergeant instructor. And she yells my name. She's like, Lieutenant Edwards. But in my head, all I heard was Candidate Edwards. I was not commissioned, and I froze. I didn't know. I was like, holy crap, that's the voice. And then I stopped. I was like, wait a minute. I'm commissioned. I'm an officer now. She's not going to yell at me. This is good. And so, you know, we went and... and uh, and said our hellos. But what was funny at officer camp school is I'd cut my hair so I didn't have to deal with it. And I'd cut it short enough and it was absolutely within regulations, but I don't think she thought it was. So I remember getting marched down to downtown Quantico and uh, to Q-Town we called it and I got stuck in a barber's chair and there was a lady who just started cutting my hair. And I tried to explain to her, just take a little off and she butchered my haircut. So phenomenally. You have to really work hard for that. So then I got in trouble for having uh, a haircut that looked like it had been cut with a spoon. So I got yelled at several times for that. And so when I run, ran into then uh, Gunnery Sergeant Manus again in Okinawa, she looks at me, shakes my hand. She's like, and I, my hair had grown out at that point. She's like, I'm glad to see you finally did something with that hair. The modern Marine Corps basic fighting unit is the infantry battalion. 
It is the infantry battalion as the building block from which all large units are assembled. Seldom does an entire regiment deploy or fight as a complete entity. Today, the Marine Expeditionary Unit, MEU, is deployed most often. The Marines developed MEUs and made them special operations capable. Two MEUs are usually afloat at any one time. They are America's 911 force, able to respond to any worldwide emergency in a matter of days and carrying everything they need to cope with any contingency. AMU is a Marine Expeditionary Unit. AMU is uh, our first line of defense or our ready line of defense that uh, you hear about them often who float around and wait to be called up. Oftentimes uh, the MUs, you're, on each coast there's one out, one getting ready to go and one on its way back um, for the east and west coast and then there's one in Okinawa. Um, the MU is what often responds to things like um, probably in Haiti, also uh, you know the earthquakes, the floods, all those major uh, dev devastating things that happen around the world, as well as uh, a lot of times they're your first line of defense if there's some sort of conflict that they'll be in there. Uh, it, it really truly defines the expedition from the sea and our amphibious nature. That's what we're built around. The MEU's ground combat element is basically a marine infantry battalion. They are supported by a platoon of assault amphibian vehicles, a platoon of tanks, light armored vehicles, and an artillery battery. I think uh, the Marine Corps is designed, we just want to put our enemy on the horns of a dilemma. I mean, if you, if you come at us from the front, we're going to hit you from the front, or we're going to hit you from the side. Uh, I think we, what we do is it's combined and integrated. We uh, strive to not make anything linear, but we want to hit you in a three-dimensional battlefield. Each MEU also has an air combat element, which contains a handful of just about every type of aircraft in the Corps inventory. The Marine Corps is really the only service that is totally self-supporting. We have our ground troops, we have our helicopters to get them in and get them out, we have our jets that provide close air support and uh, make strategic strikes and um, we don't have to really, well I guess we rely on the Navy to get us there to, to venues where we need to be, but we, we basically support our own. So as we build you know, all our plans, all our battle plans, um, we figure out how to integrate that air support so there's call for fire, there's immediate close air support. Um, we prep the battlefield with a deep fight and, we, and uh, I mean it, it probably got its origins in World War II as you, as you prepped uh, Iwo Jima and flew over and bombed the heck out of it. It's, it's, it's no different concept where you're prepping the battlefield, you're doing some prep fires, and then you roll in for the heavy attack. Um, we put those things together so that way there's eyes in the sky uh, for those Marines on the ground and those eyes in the, the sky can, can react. They can give us a heads up, hey, what's out there? This is what you got coming down. They can go on the attack. They can go on the resupply. There's all sorts of things they can do. And everything is designed to make sure that that rifleman on the ground is taken care of and he can keep the fight pushing forward. And we go to him as much as possible. Um, and so he can continue that fight and he doesn't have to worry about uh, anything else. Trained, equipped, and ready for action, Marines of the MEU and reservists from around the world knew they were going to war against Iraq. In recent days, some governments in the Middle East have been doing their part. They have delivered public and private messages urging the dictator to leave Iraq so that disarmament can proceed peacefully. He has thus far refused. All the decades of deceit and cruelty have now reached an end. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. Their refusal to do so will result in military conflict commenced 
at a time of our choosing. On orders from the Commander-in-Chief, Marines settled up in response to the call to arms. I believe it was Martin Luther King uh, weekend. I was in San Diego visiting a friend and I got recalled and we were supposed to have Monday off. Um, it was Martin Luther King or President's Day, I, I can't remember the, the exact weekend. I got recalled um, to come back to the office for a meeting. So um, that morning I got up early out of San Diego and might have gotten a speeding ticket that day, I don't really remember, and uh, drove back to Yuma and went to a meeting and that was the time when they said this is happening, we're getting the call, we're going to go, as we're deploying to Kuwait uh, for potential fall into Iraq. Um, you, Eddie, that is my nickname uh, throughout the Marine Corps, um, Eddie, you're going to go on the advance party, you leave on Thursday. We wanted to go. Uh, we wanted to go defend our country. We wanted to go meet the enemy. Um, but I don't ever remember uh, I don't remember the exact phone call or the exact time when it was said, hey, Logan, pack your trash, be here at this time, be ready to report, be ready to go defend your country. And we got, I had several phone calls of what's your count, who have you talked to? And I would get one of those every two or three hours. Uh, and then I would get other phone calls that were, hey, we haven't heard anything, we're waiting on the word, the proverbial word. But I never got a phone call until, um, probably January 2003, um, the activation orders are in hand. And, and you are getting activated, you are, you are moving forward. And that was for the invasion of Iraq. It was always a feeling of it's not when it, or if, it's not an if we're going to go. It's always, it was all a when we're going, when are we going. It wasn't an if. So there was, I think really after the September 11th attacks, there wasn't any question uh, that it was going to happen, just when it was going to happen. And I think almost, uh, I got the call, I was uh, laying next to my girlfriend, I think on a you know, Sunday morning, first sergeant finally called and said, hey, we got orders, you know, start your phone tree or whatever. For most of the Marines, the call was a welcome one. And that's, it was almost a, re a relief because for those two years, it's been like, you know, we go, we train, and I'm, I'm going to do my civilian job. and still go train I'm, so I'm still do, I still have to do this but this war is coming so it, it's it was attention you're always on edge you're always preparing you didn't know so almost that call came as a relief it's like oh I can now focus on one thing being a marine preparing for war uh, let's go um, and, and so that was kind of the initial feeling but then um, for this first appointment, it was total unknown. You know, we were going to war, you know, all we'd seen was the full metal jackets, um, your platoon, your movies on TV, you know, nobody, nobody knew how to act. We had some Desert Storm veterans, but that was a three-day war, you know. Uh, nobody in our units were from Vietnam anymore, you know, nobody in the Marine Corps, uh, you know, had a combat action ribbon, and, you know, for the most part till, uh, till this kicked off. So it was, it was totally unknown. And in the meantime, I had some of my, the rest of my company um, going in to do some of the offload of the equipment that uh, some of the, the preposition ships that we have out, they were going to offload that equipment in Kuwait. Our unit didn't have, because we were so late on the docket, so to speak, to deploy, we were embarking all our gear, but it wasn't going to make it in time because I had to, you know, slow boat to China kind of thing. Um, so once we got over there, we were going to be sharing gear with other units. Not sharing, but all the units would have to go back to the, the stubby pencil drill and see, no kidding, what gear do I need? What gear can I live without? How do I spread load this gear among five units, vice four, or whatever the number was? So uh, it was getting ready to get really exciting and, and scary in many ways. Not, you know, nail-biting scary, but just like, holy crap, this is, this is it. Now we're doing what we've been trained to do. And, oh yeah, we got a lot of training to do because I'm not really sure what we're going to do. It was totally unknown and we, you know, we, we based all of our actions and thoughts or, and we had our training, but it was also, that was also formed by Hollywood. Nobody really knew what to expect, but, you know, we were excited, we were ready to go. And really, um, I think we all felt fortunate to um, do our mission because there's plenty of Marines before us who trained, trained, trained 20 years, retired, no, combat experience and here we were we finally get to do what we trained for when we left kentucky we had the 
the great joy of going to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, which, as I've stated earlier, um, the best part about Camp Lejeune is leaving. It's, it's a wretched place, um, and, and I've never been able to figure out exactly why I don't like it. I just don't like Camp Lejeune. And I'm, you know, I'm a country boy. I'm from Kentucky, so it's not the geography or the location or, or, or the sights or sounds. I just I do not like Camp Lejeune. When we got down to Camp Lejeune, um, they, were going to, they started issuing desert utilities. Um, and they were just the, what, what we call the tea stains, just a three color desert pattern um, and desert boots. Or you had the option, you could go out and buy the new Marpat desert digital pattern because they didn't have enough of that to issue to everybody that was being activated and getting deployed. But the PX had them for, for sale. You could go out and buy a set for about 80 bucks. Um, which, believe it or not, a lot of Marines, including myself, did because the time I got up to the line to get to draw camis, they had uh, large, extra long trousers um, and uh, large or large regular blouse. You know, I, I'm six feet tall and, and some change, and uh, then I was about 185, 185 pounds. The camis didn't fit. You know, I, I look like uh, a little boy in daddy's clothes. So yeah, I went and bought my own camis and then uh, went to get boots and uh, much the same situation. I couldn't find boots that fit me, so I had to go out and uh, uh, Saigon Sam's was the name of the, the Army surplus store out in town. Went to Saigon Sam's and bought uh, desert boots. For Logan and other Marines, compared to Iraq, Lejeune was paradise. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, sir. It's all right.